Now let's take a look at non-volatile memory technology. All right, so we've kind of discussed the whole notion of what memory is. It is not made of D flip-flops. When you use the term memory, you're talking about dense arrays of storage that can store just zeros and ones. They're high density, but you give up functionality. Namely, you give up the ability to reset them, okay? So what we want to do right now is start looking at non-volatile technology and look at some of the kind of the historical ways that people have implemented non-volatile memory uh, and go through some of the acronyms that we use, okay? Non-volatile memory means that when you pull the power, it keeps its information, okay? So this is a very cool thing because you can actually store something, pour, you know, move it around, and then you come back and the information is still there. We are going to start first with a read-only memory architecture, and read-only memory means that you can only read from it, obviously. Okay? ROM and non-volatile used to go together very commonly because if you were going to make something read-only, you tended to build it with technology that you could only configure once, and that way it would hold its information, the ones and zeros, when you remove the power, but a consequence is that you could never change it again. Okay, so what we are going to first start looking at is the architecture of a ROM memory. And what I want to first start with is the notion of a pull-up resistor. Okay, we had kind of talked about the different types of states that a line can take on in a digital system that <clears throat> necessitated this whole idea of high impedance. Okay. But we also looked at a couple different values that VHDL would let you do, and that was like an H and an L. And we said, well, it's for a pull-up resistor or a pull-down resistor. But let's look specifically at what a pull-up resistor would be, okay? So let's just say that I had a line that I'm driving ones and zeros across. And this is the simple model of what we think we're doing, okay? Information is going this way, ones and zeros. But we immediately started talking about this whole notion where, you know what? this line actually might not be driven all the time. It might be driven by a transceiver, okay? And a transceiver would be something where you had an enable line on here where you might drive the line, you might drive this signal with a one and a zero, or you might just be a listener and you would disable it. So the issue then becomes a situation where when you are not driving this and this is disabled, this thing will just be floating. So imagine that you just have a floating line here. That's never a good idea when you're connected to a digital receiver because it's going to float around based on all the situation, all the environmental things that are going on around it, and it will actually cause this receiver to float. It'll go one zero one 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 zero one zero, and it'll be banging away, consuming power for no reason. <clears throat> the notion of a pull-up resistor is where you are going to put a resistor that goes up to the power supply the same power supply that all these chips run off of, and it is going to be very weak, okay? What weak means is that it's going to be something like 100K or a mega ohm. It's a, it's a big old resistor. The reason that it works this way is because if this thing's floating, nothing else is in the circuit, this will absolutely pull this line up to a 1. Absolutely. But in the situation where the driver is going to come along and start connecting to this node, we think about driving it as a transistor that's going to pull it either up or down. Now, you know that you have a full totem pole CMOS architecture right here where you drive this line and now you're going to have your pull-up resistor. What I'm, dry what I'm drawing right here is this would be the equivalent of this right here. Okay. So in a situation where you were driving a 1, you would have a CMOS be turned on, and it would pull this line up to VCC, and you'd also have a pull-up resistor to VCC, and this would absolutely be VCC. Okay? Pulling a 1 with a PMOS transistor is not very interesting because you'd already pulled it up with a resistor, but it does work for half the cases. Now what happens when you have a zero? Think about this. You're going to have this line that is pulled up to VCC through this big resistor, and then you're going to have a transistor that is an NMOS that is connected to ground, 
And what's cool about this is that this is like a switch, okay? It is, in theory, it has no resistance. So when this thing is closed, it will short this line to ground. It does not matter what the size of this resistor is in reality because the equivalent circuit will be something like this. You will have VCC through a resistor to ground, and this little ground right here, this node, is essentially that transistor when it's closed. And if you look at it right here, it is absolutely a zero. So this little architecture right here starts to form kind of the functional operation of a ROM array. Because if I look at this, I could use pull-up resistors and a pull-down NMOS transistor in order to give myself both a one and a zero at this particular node. Okay? Okay, so that's a pull-up resistor. All right, so now let's take a look at how we might build a memory array using this. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. The first thing that I want to do is I am going to create a 4x4 four four array. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a concept of an address decoder. Okay? So this is going to be an address decoder. Decoder. Now, if you remember what a decoder was back in the day, a decoder was something that took in a binary code and produced one and only one output that was asserted. So in a situation where I have a 4x4 four four memory array, I'm actually going to have four outputs of a decoder, and that is going to correspond to some input bus, which is called the address bus. And if you recall, what the address is, is it is, a, it is an integer equivalent, okay, or a decimal equivalent, to all of the memory locations in your array. So if I have a situation where I have four outputs of a decoder, that means I'm going to have two address lines. And these can take on the values 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And those are equal to, of course, decimal 0, 1, 2, and 3. So with two address lines, you can address four unique locations in memory. The location in memory is going to be observed by using individual outputs of the decoder. And we are actually going to call these something specific. We're going to call them word lines. Okay? Remember how we talked about, you know, it's a, it's a byte. It's a 16-bit word. It's a 32-bit word. When we say the word word, we're talking about a chunk of data that we access at one time. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is each of these are going to access a chunk of data. Let's call this word line 0, we'll call this word line 1, word line 2, and word line 3. This now dictates this whole m by n memory array, which is 4 by 4. These are going to be the m's. So these are, this is the 4m. Now the question is, how do you tie on 4 bits for each one of these locations? Here's what you end up doing. You are going to have bit lines... Okay, that are going to run this way, okay, and you're going to absolutely have four of them. Okay, so I'm building up my array, and I have four of these things, <clears throat> and these are going to be called bit lines. So I'll call this bit line three, bit line two, bit line one, and bit line zero. And remember that this is a read only memory. So what I'm going to do is I am going to actually read the information out down here. So this is going to be data out. Okay? And it is, of course, four bits wide. What I'll do is I'll put buffers on here just so that I can read the digital value without influencing anything within the array. So now the question becomes, how do I build the storage of this? The way that you do it is you start by putting pull-up resistors to VCC on each bit line, okay? And if you think about the way that this works, 
is what you have now done without doing anything else in the system is that data out will always see 1111. Okay? If you wire it the way that I wired, you will never see anything else besides 1111. In fact, you can change the address as many times as you want because it's not even connected yet. Okay? So now the trick is, okay, how do I connect some sort of circuit that will allow me to assert these word lines one at a time and store other information in the terms of a zero. So I can already store a one, but I want to store zeros. So here's the way that you think about this. These word lines are routed across these guys, and they're not connected. I'll put them as dotted so that you know that they're not connected. They're literally layers of metal that are orthogonal to each other, but they're above each other. Okay? And what I do is I start defining these little storage areas as this is where I can store a piece of memory. This is where I can store a piece of memory. This is where I can store a piece of memory. This is where I can store a piece of memory. If I do not put anything in there, it will store a 1. So if I wanted to have these three bits be a 1, I would just leave them like that. The way that you store a 0 at any one of these locations is you put a NMOS transistor within the cell and what you do is you connect its bottom side, its source, to ground and then you use the word line to drive its gate. This would store a zero. Let's think about how this works. <clears throat> if the word line is a zero, okay, that means this is not on. But you, so basically this, all these bits are not even connected, which is what you want. Because if this word line is a zero, that means you are not looking at this word. You only look at this word right here when the word line is asserted. So what happens if this happened to be a one? The word line this is still not connected, so it's going to drive a 1 down here. This is still not connected. This is going to drive a 1. This is still not connected. That's going to drive a 1. But this guy is going to turn on that, that transistor, and it is going to yank this line down to a 0. Okay? So this is the way that you do this. You basically use NMOS pull-down pull transistors in conjunction with these embedded pull-up resistors and you put one of these NMOSs wherever you want to store a zero. Let's think about completing the array. Let's say that I came in here and I wanted to store the following information. I wanted to have my address go from 0, 1, 2, 3, and at each one of these guys, I want to store, let's say, at address 0, I already stored 1, 1, 1, 0, so 1, 1, 1, 0. Let's say that I wanted to store 0, 0, 1, 0, and then I wanted to do 1, 1, 1, 1, and then I wanted to do 0, 1, 0, 0. Anytime I see a 0, I need to go in here and put an NMOS transistor. So here's all the storage elements that I have. Life is good. And then all I do is look at wherever I want a 0, and I put an NMOS transistor. So I've now completed 4x4 four four worth, of, worth of storage locations, and now I come along and on address 1, which would be corresponding to asserting word line 1, I want to do a 0 here, a 0 here, a 1 here, and a 0. The way that I do a 0 is I actually connect an NMOS transistor right here to ground, and I tie its gate to the word line. When I assert word line 1, it will turn on the NMOS, produce a 0 that is read out down here. Then I come along here. I need a 0 here, so I'm going to go boom, 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 boom. I connect it up there. I now got a 0 there. What do I do for a 1? You don't do anything because it will already be pulled up to VCC, so it will produce a 1. Come over here. You got to have another NMOSer tied with its gate to the word line, and I got it. If I put in address 1, I would put in 0, 1, it would assert word line 1, 
And it would then, we would look down here at data out and see what we got. What we got would be a 0, 0, 1, 0. Now let's do this one. I want to do 1, 1, 1, 1 stored at location 2. If I did location 2, I would put on the address bus 1, 0. That would assert word line 2. And I now look down here at data out, and what do I have? Well, if I want ones, I don't put anything there. I would then read out a one, 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 one. The ones are given to me by the pull persisters. All right, let's do one last one just to kind of complete it. I want a zero here, so I put an NMOS transistor. I want a one right here. I want a zero over here, so I'm going to put an NMOS transistor to ground. And I tie its gate up here. Put an NMOS transistor gate there. When I put in address 3, which is a 1, 1 over here, it will assert word line 3, and I look down on data out to see what I get out of it. When I put that word line 3 asserted, I will see a 0 here, because that NMOS turned on and pulled it down. I will see a 1 here, because the pull-up resistor is pulling it up. I will see a zero here because this NMOS is on, pulling it to ground, and I will finally see a zero here which pulls it down using this NMOS. This is the architecture of a ROM array. It's axioms, things like this. If I wanted to produce this stuff okay, using various pieces of technology, I start looking at different types of what we call ROM technology, okay? When I come along, okay, first of all, this is very asynchronous. Would you agree? So if I drew the block diagram for this, it would literally look like this. I would have an address coming in, and I would have data out going out. How many bits of address do I have? Two. How many bits of data coming out do I have? Four. It's still a, a four by four array. Okay? It's just that the address is always an encoded version of the number of word lines. This does not operate on a clock, does it? No, nah, it doesn't operate on a clock at all. But if I wanted to make this into something, so this is asynchronous, sync. If I wanted to make this into something that was synchronous, all I'd need to do is have the exact same configuration. I'd have an address, which is two bits wide, and I'd have a data out, which is four, and I'd just put a little clock on it. Where do you think I would put clocking, or what would I do to implement a clock? All I do is I only want to see data out when I get the rising edge of a clock. All I do is I just run these guys into the flip-flops, and I look right here. That's how you make this into something synchronous. And synchronous is good because you just want everything to be produced when you have a clock. Okay? So that's all you do to make this asynchronous. Not even a big deal at all. You definitely model it different in BHDL, but the, the only difference between an asynchronous and a synchronous array is you, you just slap some registers or D flip flops on the output. Okay? Notice one thing, though, that's critical to this. Is there a reset? Not at all. There is no capability to have a reset in here. These are just essentially wires and switches that, that store ones and zeros. There is no reset. Okay. Let us now look at some different technologies to create these transistors. Okay. To create these transistors. If you do... Okay, so one of the first things that they said when they started building this was, I'm going to make a memory array, and I'm going to have some sort of information that I want to store in there. I could go build a chip to do this. Absolutely. I could build a chip, piece of cake. All I do is I build the array, and then I just pop down these transistors, and I'm off and running. They immediately said that is a cost prohibitive way to do things. Okay? We need a way to kind of support uh, multiple designs without having to create a custom chip for everyone. So they first came up with this thing called MROM. Okay? MROM stands for Mask Read Only Memory. Okay? 
What mask is is this. A mask is a term for a step within the integrated circuit manufacturing process. The way that you make layers on an integrated circuit is you take a substrate like silicon and what you do is you put material over it that is photosensitive. Then you put a transparency above it, something like a plate with lines on it, and then you shine UV light through it. What happens is that that UV light hits the photosensitive material, changes its properties, and the property you're trying to change is its susceptibility to a solvent, like an acid. If you do that, then you can remove with an acid all of the photosensitive material that has been exposed. Now you've exposed <laughs> the silicon, and you can do things like add metal, okay, or add boron or phosphorus, and you can actually change the material properties of the silicon substrate. You can make it into a semiconductor, you, or a better semiconductor, a p-type, an n-type semiconductor, or you put metal down. The little transparent plate is called a mask. This MROM, or mask read-only memory, has to do with a step in the manufacturing process which connects up all these little transistors. So here is what you start with. Okay? You are going to start with an array. They build all of these ROM arrays and then they put them on a shelf. They have all the pull-up resistors and they have all the NMOS transistors there. The only difference is that they do not have the NMOS transistors connected to the bit lines. They wait. So all these chips are just sitting on the shelf. You come along and say, hello, I would like to purchase an MROM. They go, well, we're, you're in business. We've got some that are almost done. We just have one missing ingredient. That is, what are the ones and zeros you want to store? So you provide to the manufacturer a pattern of ones and zeros that you want at each array or at each location. What they do is they go in and using a final MROM mask layer, they actually add in the metal to connect the NMOS transistors up to the bit line and the word line, and that gives you your zeros. So unprogrammed, an MROM array is all ones. Not very interesting. Programmed, an MROM array now connects all of the NMOS transistors to give you zeros. Isn't that sweet? The downside of this, it's a little bit expensive. Okay, it's it's slow. It's not like, oh, I need to wait before my thumb drive reacts. This is like you send it to a, a fabrication shop. Okay, this is months potentially. But it's also pretty good because this is a rock solid piece of memory. Okay, you can put that thing potentially in outer space and it's not gonna flip. Okay, you can shock that thing, it's probably not gonna flip. So it's pretty, pretty robust. Okay? This is really good if you want to make a whole lot of memory chips that you never want to change again. Okay? You probably don't use this on like consumer electronics, like something running uh, Windows. Okay? Windows probably doesn't want to be implemented on this. Okay? <clears throat> but a satellite would, something that's never coming back to Earth, something you're sending out to like Jupiter, okay? you're not going to upload new code to it. Okay? It's like, oh, I got another bit stream I want to upload. It's like, no, you got one chance. Okay? This thing's going for eternity out to Jupiter. Anyway, that's what MROM is. Kind of neat because it's a technology that gives us the ability to have my zeros. Okay? That's all it is, MROM. Now, they said, you can do better. So we came up with the programmable read-only memory. Okay? Now you say, what is a programmable read-only memory? This is going to be called your PROM. You may have heard of the PROM, okay? but here's what happens on a PROM. A PROM actually says, I'm going to give you the ability to program your memory after you have it. So you're going to purchase the chip, and you get the chip. It's no longer at the fabrication house. And you are going to program it yourself. The way that you do it is they go in and they have connected all of the NMOS transistors up, but they have connected the drain through a fuse. This is the symbol for a fuse right here. Okay? What is a fuse? A fuse is a piece of metal that's very thin and it's rated for a certain amount of current. If it's rated for a milliamp, works fine. You put 10 milliamps in it, the thing burns and opens. 
So what you do with a prom is you program the array, the memory array, by blowing fuses. So in its normal state right here with everything connected, the entire array gives you zeros. Everybody's pulled down. Now you say, let's program this baby. You come in and you go into a programmer and you blow all the fuses. All it does is it just has extra circuitry that runs a high current through each of the fuses you want to blow and it pops them. And then you're done. It's a one-time shot though. And this is like literally, you have the chip, it's all zeros. Hey, I got a memory array. I want to put some ones in there. You put it into a programmer, it's usually an external thing, and you go, and it comes out. <coughs> one-time shot. That's called a prom. This is also a pretty, it's better than an MROM in terms of speed. Okay, I mean, in terms of manufacturing time, but it's still a one-time shot. Okay, you only get one. You know what you do if you mess up? Just throw it in the garbage. Just throw it in the garbage and hope it's cheap. Okay? They said you can do better. <laughs> this sucks. We want to be able to program it and then reprogram it. So they came up with the erasable prom. Now, this is getting into terminology you may have heard. This is going to be an EEPROM, still not the double EEPROM, but here's the way that this works. This is based on a different type of technology that is actually what's used in all of your thumb drives today. It is called a floating gate transistor, and this is pretty wicked. It is a transistor that has an additional gate. Not a separate pin, but it's got a metal oxide, metal oxide semiconductor. So it's a, not a MOS, it's a MOMOS. Okay? And the reason that you have this MOMOS is because, remember the voltage that it takes to turn on a transistor? Like if you have a transistor that runs off of like 3.3 volts, it might take 0.7 to turn it on. Where does that 0.7 come from? It comes from the structure, the geometries of the transistor. One of the biggest structures is how far away this metal is from the semiconductor. Well, what you can do here is you can start off by saying, oh, I've got a metal, oxide, metal, oxide. And what you can do is you can use electricity in order to go into that upper oxide and blast it and turn it into a conductor. So you actually go into the insulating material and you inject, through the use of electricity, carriers, charge carriers. Once that thing becomes conductive, now the thickness of the little MO structure is very thin. So it doesn't take very much energy to turn it on. But compared to this guy right here, this guy right here that has the MO, MO, it's got two oxides in there. This takes more voltage to turn it on. The way they design these is that if you're running off of, let's say, 3.3 volts, you do this one and it turns on like normal. It takes 0.7 volts to turn on. But this one takes like four volts to turn on, okay? You now have created a transistor that can never be, by doing it to the point where it's not programmable, that's beautiful because what you've done is you basically created like a short, okay? This floating gate transistor is the basis for everything we have today, okay? It's got this additional floating gate. That's why it's called a floating gate transistor. But here's the way that it originally worked. You use electricity to convert that floating gate, that floating oxide, into a conductive material. And that would program something. But then to erase it, you actually used ultraviolet light. Okay? And this is where it becomes really interesting because you need a way to get ultraviolet light into a chip. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> You actually had chips created with little glass windows on the top of them. Okay? This is actually what I used when I was in college. So you would come over to program your chip, and you would put it in a programmer, and you'd hit the electricity. And then you'd go test it. And you had a bug okay, in, your pro in your memory. Okay? Your program didn't run. So then you'd go and you'd put it inside of a little drawer and put it into a little miniature tanning bed, a little ultraviolet light, and you would wait for like five minutes, and then it would be cleared and the thing would be ready to be programmed again. So a lab looked a lot different than today. Everybody was standing in line to use this ultraviolet 
eraser, <laughs> and then everybody would go up, boom, and then come over here, program it, go test it, wouldn't work, get back in line. So you can imagine the, no, the, the iterations of programming, you know, designs that you could test were very, very minimal, okay? They said, this, this little EEPROM thing is awesome. You can do better than that, though. <laughs> You'll be even better than having a window on the top of a chip. I mean, if you see one of these things, you just blow your mind. You're like, it's got a window. It's got a glass window on the top of it. You can see the chip underneath this it's silicon. Wouldn't it be cool if we could, we could erase it with electricity? We can program it with electricity. Wouldn't it be cool if we could erase it, too? That is where you get to the electrically erasable prom, the double E prom. That's what we finally get today. In the beginning of them, they still required a programmer, so you'd have to take the chip out because the, the voltage in order to, to erase them was higher than what you had in your system. So you still had to take it over to an eraser and go, mm -hmm. and then you take it to a programmer and go, mm -hmm. the big breakthrough became when they finally added circuitry on the chip that could erase and program using voltages that you had on your system already. So this became something where you had a chip that was a non-volatile ROM array, and if you wanted to erase it, you could erase it and reprogram it, okay? So this is pretty sweet. This is the basis for solid state memory today. So this is where the flash drive came from, okay? It's this technology, and then that became the solid state drive, and ultimately you got to what we call flash today, and flash is nothing more than double EEPROM, but the way that they architected it is, instead of having you provide an address for each word, okay? So you have a song, you have like an MP3 file, and it's on a flash drive, okay? You go to the first address, and if you want to read the song out, you know you're going to have an address counter. It's like address 1, address 2, address 3, address 4. They noticed that everybody was always providing a starting address, and then you'd stream a ton of data out. So they said, you know what, don't even give me a whole bunch of addresses. I'm going to start giving you the information in what's called these blocks. Okay? So instead of actually providing individual addresses, you provide a, a starting address, and then the flash will stream out a chunk of data. Okay? It's very good for things like music and video, where you have a stream of information that you read sequentially out, and you just want it flowing. Not so good if you're going to be interacting with it on a byte-to-byte -byte level. So it's not something you want to like, oh, I want to write one byte. It's like, no, 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 no. You want to write a byte, you got to write the whole block. It's like a 4K block. And you want to read that one byte, read the whole 4K block out, and then just pick out your little byte. Okay? So that's what Flash is. There's two types, in order, there's two types of technology. One is called NAND Flash, and one is called NOR Flash. And the only difference between the two is just the way that you connect the streaming information. It's just an architectural change between them. And there you have it. NAND flash tends to have bigger blocks. So those are all the different types of technologies that we have for non-volatile memory.